Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. <clears throat> I'm Adrian Fort, and we are here for the third in a six-part series as we bathe in the baths. An Enemy of the People by Henrik Ibsen. We're going act by act through, and this is, of course, this is the, as it is the third video, this is the third act third of five so we're right at the we're right at the turning point it is necessary to remember and uh just a reminder we've also done peer again ghosts and a doll's house from henrik ibsen on the channel a full read through along with a review based on the text uh and what we're going to do this episode is we're going to do a recap and then we're going to get into a discussion of the literary happenings um of this act so we begin with an evening at the newspaper presses as Hofstad is hard at work when Billing rushes in having just read the doc's paper and who we it is a doozy um there are there are the two are extremely sure uh having just read this article that revolution is afoot against the aristocracy and shortly after their discussion the doc himself shows up uh, it turns out he's planned four or five more articles, all attacking the water supply, all about the water supply, uh, and how unsafe it is. And just as Hofstad had feared, Alaskan shows up, and he is pushing for temperance. And it is denied. And we get a little bit of a sense that perhaps betrayal is afoot after all, on page 36, Dr. Stockman says, All the incapables must be turned out, you understand, and that in every walk of life. Endless vistas have opened, have opened themselves to my mind's eye today. I cannot see it all quite, I cannot see it all quite clearly yet, but I shall in time. Young and vigorous standard bearers those are what we need and must seek, my friends. We must have new men in command at our posts, at our outposts. This is all scary stuff. Uh, after this, Victorious, uh, in his moment of victory, shining victory with Hobstad and Billing on his side and even Alaskan uh, coming around, the doc departs. Um, and then in an argument about prudence, Alaskan outs Billings, as Billings uh, has the ambition to be the secretary of the bench. Uh, Alaskan goes off to do his work, and the other two muse about Alaskan's dismissal to Hofstad and Billings. Billings uh, assures Hofstad that he is not hoping to be the secretary of the bench, but you've got to make that run. You've got to make the run and see what happens of it. You've got to be in the game at some level. Then, on page 38, Billing. It is an infernal nuisance that we don't possess some capital to trade on. Hofstad sitting down at his desk. Yes, if only we had that then. Billing. Suppose we were to apply to Dr. Stockman. Hofstad turning over some papers. What is the use? He has nothing. No, but he has got a warm man in the background, old Morton Kill, the Badger, as they call him. Um, are, Hofstad says, are you so sure he has anything? And Billing says, good Lord, of course he has. And some of it must come to the Stockmans. Most probably he will do something for the children at all events. Uh, this is scheming. Scheming between the... Uh, are they... Are they communists? What, what, what exactly is the party here? What exactly are we hoping for from these two? Uh, what exactly are these two scheming for? We need some capital. Das Kapital. Uh, Hofstad then retreats to work, and Petra comes to visit him. She's returning uh, the story that she was asked to translate because it goes against everything that Hofstad preaches. What does it say? It says that spooky forces protect the good people and punish the bad ones. Hofstad replies, coming to us from page 39, uh, when she says, you can't print this, you can't do it. He says, um, 
Where is it here? Uh, you were perfectly right, but an editor cannot always act as he would prefer. He is obliged to bow to the wishes of the public in, an, in unimportant matters. In unimportant matters, the truth maybe doesn't necessarily matter. Um, politics are the most important thing in life, for a newspaper anyway. And if I want to carry my public with me on the path that leads to liberty and progress, I must not frighten them away. If they find a moral tale of this sort in the serial at the bottom of the page, they will be all the more ready to read what is printed above it. They feel more secure, as it were. It's important, uh, but yikes. We can lie to them just a little bit, um, because then we're more likely to get our way with the narrative that we're trying to pass off. Sound familiar? Further, with the revolution that Hofstad worries, uh, with the revolution, Hofstad worries most for Petra. Uh, and he says, she says, she'll never forgive him for that. Um, don't have me in mind, you know, do what is right. Um, Alaskan interrupts this meeting and says that the mayor is outside inter Mayor Pete. Pete says that the medical officer of the baths is at fault for all of the uh, nastiness with the water supply. Then he drops the bombshell that the replacements, the repairs, will take fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, which will be, of course, taxpayer funded, and hey, it'll take two years to get these things done, which is all just terrible. It's impossible. It can't happen. This must not happen. They all agree. Uh, it is double cross. But ho, as the doc returns and Mayor Pete is shoved into another room. The doc shows up to say, hey, I know, I know, but no parades, okay? And as he is doing this, Mrs. Stockman shows up and uh, she says, hey, we got to think of the children and me. <laughs> in the heat of the argument, the doc notices Pete's stuff just sitting there. And Pete, Mayor Pete, he's not one to just leave his stuff laying around. He must be present. So he takes Pete's stuff, he finds Pete, and he taunts Pete with Pete's stuff, dressing up as if he were the mayor himself. This is when the doc learns that everyone, absolutely everyone, in the course of him, in the time since he left the newspaper press, absolutely everyone has turned on him. Mrs. Stockman notices this too, so she stands by his side, and he and her leave as they promise that the truth will get out. So the first thing that I want to talk about with this uh, act comes to us from pages 34 and 35. Dr. Stockman says, the article is only the beginning. I have already got four or five more sketched out in my head. Where is Alaskan? Billing calls into the burning room. Alaskan, just come here for a minute. Hofstad says, four or five articles, did you say? On the same subject? And Dr. Stockman says, no. Far from it, my dear fellow. They are about quite another matter. But they all spring from the question of the water supply and the drainage. One thing leads to another, you know. It is like it is like beginning to pull down an old house. Exactly. The doc has drafted four or five more articles, and they are all on issues strictly with the water supply. Just with the water supply, there's all these issues. And those issues, as we come to learn, well, the first series of issues themselves will take fifteen to 20000 taxpayer dollars. But that doesn't matter because it is the truth. And it will take two years crushing the economy. But that doesn't matter because it is the truth and people are going to get sick. This is the moment. Well, and later on in the act, we have uh, even his wife proclaiming how simple it is to dupe the doc. We have to wonder, is the doc a loon? And remember... He's just coming back to the town from a sort of exile, isn't he? He and the children were away for a while. Now, 
If you spent any amount of time on this channel, you know how I feel about academe, and you know how I feel about the establishment, and all of these things, and how I think that um, often, I think that structures of power have become slick and slimy enough that you don't see them coming. And worse than that, Neither, neither do they themselves see themselves coming. Hofstad and Billings here at the beginning are talking about how great it would be to have some capital. They are, um, it seems, if we're, if we're putting this in, in modern day context, Hofstad and Billings seem to be the liberal elite, right? The elites of the elites. Alaskan seems to be the middle class, willing to be swayed, but he has his sentiments. He doesn't want the boat rocked too much because, after all, the middle class has taken their entire lives to build what they have. Um, the middle class is a constantly struggling class because the middle class is constantly moving in society. Uh, that's part of the reason why it's so confounding to see a shrinking middle class in the United States. There's all these graphs going around, I don't know if you've seen them, that show the middle class around the world and how the United States middle class is just slowly shrinking, and someplace like China, the middle class is growing. Um, but the middle class is a class that is constantly in struggle. Uh, there is, in, in our society, there's a safety net at the bottom. I'm not trying to get into politics, but what, what I'm doing is setting the scene for what we're reading here. Um, there's a safety net at the bottom. It's not much of a safety net, right? Um, you... you but it is possible to fall to the bottom of society and not fall further. With the middle class, it's con you, the middle class has to constantly work harder to keep where they are. That's why someone like Alaskan, who represents, I believe, the middle class, does not want to rock the boat too much. The liberal elites, um, just like the conservative elites, right? Again, I'm not trying to get into politics of the day, but it is awfully strange how well the politics of this play graft onto today. Here, we're getting the liberal elite. Um, and the liberal elite is constantly convincing themselves that they are not elite. Hofstad and Billing control the mouthpiece of this society, and they convince themselves they have no capital awfully strange then that they have to be coming after the people who do have capital. The people who are in, in this situation, Morton Kill, who is an old conservative, it seems, who didn't want all of this change to take place, which is what conservative means. Um, the old conservative, well, he has capital. And mightn't we just sort of cipher some of that out for ourselves? Uh, this whole mouthpiece of society, th this doesn't count as capital because it's something we have. Um, so this is leading me to a quote, a rather lengthy quote. So I'm going to ask that you bear with me. But it is, it is a great quote for this situation. And honestly, I want to thank um, old Ibsen himself because I have been meaning to go back and copy this quote down for quite a long time. This quote comes from Eric Weinstein. And it comes from Eric Weinstein in his first appearance on the Lex Friedman podcast. And I had to copy it down by hand. It doesn't exist anywhere. He is talking about, is Eric Weinstein, revolution of the intellectual realm. Of taking the presumptions of academia. Stepping outside of it. And because... And, and, and making some adjustment on what is the standard practice, the, the SOP, Standard Operating Procedure. Saying, uh, so uh, for example, this sounds a lot like, well, Einstein there. Einstein worked as a patent clerk while he was developing all of his most important scientific revolutions. He couldn't get a post at an, at, at an academy. He couldn't get a job as a professor. So he was working as a patent clerk and revolutionizing science. 
So the quote from Weinstein is as such about, again, academic revolution. If you do it inside academics, you are forced to constantly show great loyalty to the consensus and you distinguish yourself with small, almost microscopic heresies to make your reputation in general. And you have very competent people and brilliant people who are working together to form very a very deep social network and who um, and who have a very high level of behavior and who love a very I'm sorry this I had to copy it down in my own handwriting at breakneck speed because of the way he speaks but um, form a very deep social network and who have a very high level of social behavior at least within the matter at least within mathematics and technically within theoretical physics when you go outside you meet lunatics and crazy people madmen and these are people who do not usually subscribe to the consensus opinion and almost always lose their way. And the key question is will progress likely come from someone who is miraculous who has miraculously managed to stay within the system and is able to take on larger amounts of heresy that is sort of unthinkable. In which case it will be fascinating. Or is it more likely that someone will be able to maintain and make uh, maintain a level of discipline from outside of academics and be able to make use of the freedom that comes from not having to constantly affirm your loyalty to the consensus of your field which is more likely that one of these um, suit and tie wearing intellectuals will revolutionize things little bit by little bit until they're able to bite off a whole chunk or will it be one of the madmen who doesn't give a damn about anyone's opinion in this story it is the doc which is the madman doc's a madman he's outside of everything um, and he's so his wife simultaneously notes in this act how yes of course I recognize that you are the most brilliant man in town but you are so easily duped is he is he so easily duped or is he constantly falling is he constantly catching on to little threads of things that maybe you can't understand or is he just a madman who has lost his way who is not a revolutionary but someone who is incapable of seeing the good from the bad which is it it is interesting that we are getting this to play with here. Uh, the next thing, we've discussed a little bit how Alaskan seems to be the middle class and how Hofstad and Billings are sort of the social elite. On 38 here, Alaskan says, It is no business of mine, but if I am to... If I am accused of timidity and inconsistency in my principles, that is what I want to point out. My political past is an open book. I have never changed, except perhaps to become a little more moderate, you see. My heart is still with the people, but I don't deny that my reason has a certain bias towards the authorities. The local ones, I mean. So here... With a bias towards the authorities, the local ones, I mean, he's talking about the authorities as they are as they are standardized. He's not talking about the authority that is the social elite and the mouthpiece, Hofstad and Billingsley. He seems to be talking about the social the um, the cons he's leaning towards the conservative nature of his character, which seems to be leaning towards the Morton Kills. The, uh, the old badger, the Republicans, the conservatives. Um, but in this, he, is, he even seems a little weary of the game at all. So this is sort of the middle class teetering on libertarianism, maybe. 
it is so fascinating to see all of these things as they are blowing up in our face today, appearing in a play that is so many years old. Um, and speaking of that, A, they're talking about the uh, Mr. Kill being attacked, which is the, uh, basically sounds like a communist revolution, doesn't it? But on 36, we do have that, that quote again from the doc. All the incapables must be turned out, you understand, and that in every walk, and that in every walk of life. Endless vistas have been opened to themselves have been opened themselves to my mind's eye. I cannot see all quite clearly yet, but I shall in time. Young and vigorous standard bearers. Those are what we need and must seek, my friends. We must have new men in command at all our outposts. What is the argument? Hell, if we, we already talked a little bit about Eric Weinstein. Eric Weinstein is talking about the need for the boomers to, to bow out peacefully. Um, and it is strange that we have this conversation today about boomers and zoomers and all of these things and how the boomers are refusing to take their role as um, experienced advisors, as the, the class of wisdom. Boomers are refusing to become the wise because to become the wise means to give up your reins on today's society. Um, and it seems this is not something that is new or unique to the United States in 2020. Uh, it is a, a conversation that has happened before and is probably constantly happening. I wonder if the reason it seems so obvious today is because of the transparency at almost all levels of society based on social media. Um, we are constantly being hammered with the fact that both Trump and Biden are in their 70s. And I'm saying this leading up to a presidential election. So, you know, I'm reading this leading up to a presidential election. So you'll have to pardon me if you're watching this in the future. But I think that it's going to, it's going to be worth bearing in mind regardless. Um, would we constantly be bombarded with that information if we weren't constantly bombarded with information? Does the fact that we are constantly bombarded with information change the way that we look at information? Would we have thought of these men as both being particularly old if the election happened 30 years ago? If this were the 1990 election? Or 92, I guess it was. Um, even though the 92 election had what was apparently a suave Bill Clinton involved. Uh, versus the establishment of George Bush the first, George Bush the first, it is uh, it's definitely strange to read and scary stuff to be to be prescient of. You know, if, if this is the way we're uh, thinking of things now, how will we think of them in the future? Um, speaking of this, it is impressive here on forty two. If I get my fingers to work for me, Mayor Pete shows up. But look there, but look, but look, but look there. That is the thing I was speak. That is the thing I was speaking of. And Alaskan says, yes, that is the doctor's article, Mr. Mayor. Hofstad replies, oh, is that what you were speaking about? Is that what you were, I had no idea. And Peter Stockman says, yes, that is it. What did you think of it? Hofstad says, oh, um, I'm only a layman. And I have only taken a very cursory glance at it. And Peter says, but you are going to print it? To which Hofstad replies, I cannot very well refuse a distinguished man. He doesn't stand up for his principles. He turns coward in their face. Uh, it, it is a, it's a stunning thing to see how quickly the... Um, how quickly people who are resolute in this play are turning on their resolutions, all except for the doctor. Um, well, and Mayor Pete, for that matter, it seems that the Stockman is 
uh, from sturdier stock. Bum, bum, bum. So the final question that I think is worth raising comes to us from page 46. Dr. Stockman, again, when um, everyone in the world at this point has turned on him, even his wife is uh, begging him to, uh, to drop the issue. He says, are you out of your senses, Catherine? Because a man has a wife and children, is he not allowed to proclaim the truth? Is he not allowed to be an actively useful citizen? Is he not to be allowed to do a service to his native town? This is interesting. Um, and then two lines later, Alaskan offers. Um, so after this, Mrs. Stockman says, yes, Thomas, in reason. And Alaskan says, just what I say, moderation is everything. So here, in, in the face of catastrophe, Alaskan is still saying, hey, let's, let's just not rock the boat, guys. Things have just gotten good, guys. Come on. Things were just coming around. Things are just coming around. All of a sudden, everything's a problem. Come on, let's just rein it in. Let's just rein it in a little bit. Uh, it is interesting to see. Um, but it raises the question, if Alaskan is the middle class... Is the middle class the family class? The family man is not supposed to rock the boat. Think of the children, won't you? Think of your wife, won't you? If he's not supposed to rock the boat, um, is the middle class, does this, does this idea go both ways? The middle class is not supposed to rock the boat. The family man is not supposed to rock the boat. Are we generally viewing the middle class as the family class. Um, the upper class can afford to raise whatever concerns they damn well please because no matter what happens, they're pretty much going to be fine. The lower class cannot afford to have these concerns at all. The lower class um, doesn't feel as if their voice is being heard regardless, so why have an opinion? It's the middle class who is begging for temperance. Uh, but that's all of the observations that I have from this the third act of the play that is an enemy of the people. Next week, we will have the penultimate episode of this series, which is act four, well, the penultimate um, act from this play, which is act four. Then we will have act five, and then finally a review. Uh, I hope to see you back here next time for act four.